Whoa, zoom lens. What on earth is this? So, let's cut to the chase. This is probably a transport installation that you've heard of before. It's an iconic piece of engineering that was four decades in the making and looks set to revolutionize high-speed travel in Europe once it was unleashed on the public, with speeds of up to 314 miles an hour and an energy-efficient design that could even see it replace conventional rail across Germany and the rest of the continent. Even if you aren't familiar with this story, you'll probably be aware that the high-speed revolution that this thing once promised never really came to fruition, as evidenced by the fact that Europe isn't currently covered in a spider web of high-speed maglev lines. But if you are familiar with this story, you will likely be aware that the Transrapid and the dream of a new horizon of high-speed transport that it once promised ended in exceptionally tragic fashion. The mighty maglev is a piece of technology that holds a special place in my heart, as well as I'm sure many public transit enthusiasts around the world. Short for magnetic levitation, they are basically trains that are suspended just off the surface of a guideway by extremely powerful electromagnets, allowing the train to glide smoothly and thus avoid rail resistance and turbulence. This lack of friction means that they are capable of extraordinarily high speeds. The current title of world's fastest train is held by a maglev, the Yamanashi Prefecture Maglev Line in Japan, which can hit speeds of up to 600 kilometers an hour, or 373 miles an hour. Most maglevs use fully electronic control systems that ensure that the vehicle hovers at an average distance of about 10 millimeters, or 3 eighths of an inch, from the guideway. It's kind of confusing, and I was surprised when I read this. Rather than using the repulsive magnetic force to lift the train off the track, as you probably would expect, they use the attractive forces between the individual electromagnets in the vehicle and a strip of ferromagnetic rails, quote-unquote, on the underside of the guideway. So the train and this bit housing the magnets are pulled up from below, rather than being pushed up from above, if that makes sense. I'm not really explaining it very well. It should be said that there's some debate over whether or not a maglev really is a train, as it has neither wheels nor a conventional track. I don't know, nobody cares, let's move on. Maglevs have always been a source of fascination for me. I feel like it's partially because they're, they, they, well, I think it's because they sit in a sort of limbo where they are at once tried and tested technology, but also represent a sort of future that never came to be or a present that isn't fully formed like nobody uses maglevs really and yet they were such a big part of like i remember my childhood i would you know i can remember being sat cross-legged on the floor of my parents living room watching you know vhs's of like train compilations or whatever and they'd often include maglevs and like prototypes of maglevs and i remember thinking like god by the time i'm an adult i'm gonna be zooming all around europe and the world on maglevs going 500 miles an hour and uh yeah it was all really exciting. But fast forward 25 years, and while many small maglevs were eventually put into production around the world, this high-speed technology never truly took off in the way it once promised to. And to some extent, that promise ended right here, at the test track for the Trans Rapid in Latin in North Germany. But let's jump back a few decades. Now, the earliest recorded mention of the maglev as a concept dates all the way back to New York in 1902, when the rather clunkily named Albert Albertson submitted a patent for, quote, improvements in railways and cars and magnetic appliances therefore, and threw in some lovely artist renditions of a future where we all scoot around the US in magnetic trains shaped like lemons. This design, as you might have noticed by the lack of lemons darting about upstate New York, was never constructed in real life, but inspired engineers across the subsequent decades to patent a slew of maglev concepts, none of which were built. However, in... However, this feels very Alan Partridge, doesn't it? Um, however, in the 1960s, countries like West Germany and Japan uh, were experiencing massive industrialization and uh, urbanization. And so they needed to think of ways to get people in between major population centers quickly and efficiently. And so some of them started to dust off the old maglev idea. In 1969, West Germany's Federal Ministry of Transport commissioned a high-speed rapid transit study 
handing out research grants for the development of prototypes and the conducting of feasibility studies. And by 1970, they had their first result. The Messerschmitt Bulkov Blohm Company, yes, that Messerschmitt, let's just gloss over that for now, or MBB as I'm going to call it, created a six meter indoor test track in Ottobrunn in Bavaria and one year later would unveil the MBB prototype, or MBB Prinzipfahrzeug, a clunky four-seater train weighing almost five tons and reaching just 90 kilometers per hour, which it achieved on a 660 meter test track in the same facility. It wasn't exactly mind-blowing, but these were the early days. Once the Kraus Maffe group got involved in the maglev scene, things really accelerated, with the introduction of the Transrapid O2 in 1972, which was rolled out on a 930 meter long test track in Allach, also in Bavaria. And for the Transrapid O3, they absolutely fucked it, and they just started making like air cushion trains. They completely changed the design, so they're similar to like a hovercraft. And I'm sure the West German government, who had just been throwing millions of Deutschmark at this consortium to specifically make the maglevs, were like, can you not? And they were like, oh shit, sorry lads. And so for the Transrapid 04, they went back to making maglevs again. Uh, and by that point, they were hitting speeds of like 250 kilometers an hour. For Transrapid 05 in 1979, the Transrapid EMS consortium was formed between Kraus Maffei, Messerschmitt Bölkov Blom, and Thyssen Henschel. God, I regret writing out the full names of the manufacturers of these things. It was the first one approved for passenger transport and was unveiled at the 1979 International Transport Exhibition in Hamburg on a 908 meter long elevated track. It commuted for 12 hours a day at 10 minute intervals at a white knuckle maximum speed of 75 kilometers an hour, but still managed to transport a total of 55,000 people during the exhibition period, despite its snail-esque pace. The success of the Hamburg Expo not only showed the public that maglevs could be the future, but convinced the West German government that this was an avenue worth pursuing, and plans were subsequently made to create trans-rapid links between Hamburg and Berlin, as well as one in Munich and one in Westphalia, which is like Dortmund and that kind of area. To coincide with this massive spike in interest, a hugely upgraded test facility was constructed in 1978 in the province of Emsland, where I am now. Uh, and this region was chosen because it's mostly empty, it had high unemployment at the time, and the government also owned a lot of the land here anyway. Now, researching this kind of stuff takes me to some weird corners of the internet. Old transport forums, German university archives, and well, I mean, actually, that one's only applicable to places that are in Germany, and uh, places that definitely weren't built with cybersecurity in mind. And that's why I use Surfshark, who are kindly sponsoring this video. It's a VPN that keeps my connection encrypted, so when I'm working on public Wi Fi, whether it's in an airport cafe or some dodgy guest house near an abandoned railway, my data stays private. It also means that I can still stream and access my usual sites when I'm abroad, which is honestly a lifesaver during long, dull filming trips, and even more so in countries with restricted internet access, which is proving surprisingly common in this uh, corner of YouTube. So if you want to try it, go to surfshark.com slash onearth, or use my code onearth at checkout to get four extra months of Surfshark VPN added to your plan. So thanks again to Surfshark, and now back to the 1980s. It took a while, but in 1983, the Transrapid 06 finally made its debut on the incomplete test track, and by 1984, it was hitting speeds of 250 kilometers an hour, still before the track was complete, which kind of freaked me out when I read it. 1984 also marked the opening of the world's first commercial maglev in Birmingham, but it wasn't a high-speed design, so we're not going to talk about it now. The track was finally completed in 1987, with a 12 kilometer straight bookended by two massive 14 kilometer loops that eventually allowed for speeds of up to 412 kilometers an hour, a world record, which was achieved in December of that same year. In 1988 came the Transrapid 07, which hit speeds of 450 kilometers an hour in 1993, and then in the year 2000 came the official unveiling of the Transrapid 08. Now, this is where the story slows down a bit. As any person of millennial age or older will tell you, the late 90s and early 2000s were an age defined by a relentless optimism regarding the future of technology, spurred on by major political and social changes following the end of the Cold War. With long-lasting peace between nations, well, mainly between Western nations, and an increase in people being lifted out of poverty, well, mainly in Western nations, societies were primed to dream big about what technology could achieve. 
It was a time when the internet was rapidly transforming how people connected, and innovations like mobile phones and DVDs made the future feel tantalizingly close. In this context, transportation was no exception. Governments and engineers began envisioning systems that would redefine how people moved, faster, cleaner, and more efficiently than ever. As a result, this really was the heyday of the Transrapid. The new sleek 08 model was showcased at Expo 2000 in Hanover. Uh, public interest was growing day by day, and the Transrapid Consortium was even contacted by the Chinese government, who wanted them to build the world's first commercial high-speed maglev line in Shanghai. Is this green screen? Oh man, I'm so bored of accidentally teleporting. This is the extraordinarily boringly named Shanghai Maglev Demonstration Operation Line, which is a peculiar title to still have considering it entered service 23 years ago in 2002. It uses the Transrapid technology manufactured in Germany and tested in Emsland, hence German Chancellor Gerhard Schröder rocking up at the opening ceremony, and runs between Shanghai Pudong Airport and this strange station which is not in the city centre and it was a f***ing nightmare trying to get into the city centre from here. Since it began operations, this maglev system has used ever so slightly modified versions of the Transrapid 08, called Transrapid SMTs, and originally boasted a top speed of 501 km an hour, allowing it to cover the line's 30 km length in just over 7 minutes. This made it by far the fastest commercial train in the world. In 2020, the line was limited to just 300 km an hour, which seems a bit lame, but the train still completes the journey in 8 minutes, so there's not really a huge difference. The construction of the Shanghai Transrapid demonstrated a willingness from the Chinese government to take large financial and technological risks to drive innovation, such has been their modus operandi since the turn of the century, for better or worse. But this maglev has been beset with all sorts of problems. While it's extremely efficient in terms of passenger throughput, and it's ridiculously fast, it's also massively expensive to run and has failed to make a profit in literally any of the 23 years since it opened. There's also a theory that the speed limit reduction was enacted due to the immense strain it was putting on Shanghai's already overloaded power grid when operating at full speed. It's been suggested that the Chinese government was always expecting to just eat the cost of the Shanghai Transrapid, as it was more of a litmus test for the feasibility of maglevs as a high-speed transit option across the rest of China, as well as testing public acceptance of the technology. Although when it comes to the latter of the two, the authorities were left highly embarrassed when a proposed extension of the line to Hangzhou, 157 kilometers to the west, was met with furious protests from the residents along the line, many of whom were convinced that the magnets in the track would cause radiation poisoning, which is not how this technology works, but it seems to have had the desired effect because the line was eventually scrapped. Whether or not the Shanghai Transrapid was a success from a financial perspective, or a practical one, there's no doubt that it's an extremely cool and exciting project that has shown that, while it may certainly need a few tweaks in order to bring the operating costs and power demand down, and the public needs reassurance regarding radiation emissions for some reason, there is potentially still a world ahead of us in which maglevs reign supreme. I found a, a fellow British traveller on the maglev. Where, what's your name? John. And where are you going? I'm going to Shanghai. As we all are. Um, uh, and what do you think of the maglev? I'm pretty impressed. I mean, it's very fast, extremely fast. We're currently traveling at 301 kilometers per hour. Uh, so we're going to get there pretty quickly. Uh, it's very comfortable, it's very clean, uh, and seems, yeah, first rate. Excellent. And finally, can you confirm that you are, in fact, my father? Um, yes, I am your father. There you go, you heard it here first. There you go. <laughs> Thanks for that. On the 22nd of September 2006, a Transrapid 08 vehicle left the station at the test track in Emsland for a routine test in which speeds of up to 450 kilometers per hour were expected. Occasionally, the Transrapid Consortium would invite people to be on the train during the tests in order to showcase the mechanical prowess of the Transrapid. And today happened to be one of those days, with 24 invitees on board, along with seven people who worked at the Transrapid test site. In order to check for changes in the guideway surface, the first lap would see the 08 reach around 170 km an hour, before increasing to full speed for subsequent laps. It accelerated down the straight section to the south, achieving a speed of 170 km an hour as it rounded the southern loop to rejoin the straight section. But then, 57 seconds after leaving the station, the train slammed on the emergency brakes. 
Ahead of the train, awaiting clearance to exit the loop and make its way to a depot perpendicular to the test track, was a 60-ton maintenance vehicle. The dispatchers had forgotten to clear this vehicle to leave the track via a switch, and as it waited, it had inadvertently found its way directly into the path of the oncoming Transrapid. The emergency brake activation was far too late to avoid disaster, and the lightweight maglev collided with the maintenance vehicle at 162 kilometers an hour, or 101 miles an hour, and was effectively obliterated on impact. All but eight of the occupants of the train, 23 people, were killed instantly. The disaster was a traumatic experience for the community and Germany as a whole. I don't want to delve too much into the technical details of the accident, nor the immediate failings that allowed it to happen. Fellow Southeast Londoner Plainly Difficult has already covered those topics in far better detail than I could. I wanted to come to the test track, here in Latin in Lower Saxony, in order to get a better sense of what the Transrapid actually was, and the future it once represented. The PR damage done to the Transrapid by the accident was immeasurable. No longer was it an exciting, cutting-edge representation of the might of German engineering and forward planning. Now, despite having been three decades in the making, it had reverted to its original status as an untrustworthy, experimental curiosity that was not ready for interaction with a deeply sceptical public. This is despite the fact that the accident was caused by a dispatch mistake and had nothing to do with the technology itself. In fact, due to the sequential directional activation of magnets on a maglev, it is nearly impossible for maglev trains to collide with one another. But by chance, the maintenance vehicle involved in the accident was not magnetic and thus used traditional tires to traverse the track. It's understandable that the minutiae of the event, these key details that exonerated the maglev itself, passed the public by. All they knew was that this burgeoning alien technology had directly resulted in the deaths of 23 people and was no longer a symbol of the future of transport. In the aftermath of the accident, the German authorities were caught in two minds. The federal government initially attempted to assuage the public's fears by pressing on with the Transrapid experiment, and in 2007 the Transrapid 09 was launched. But before it could be tested, the Lower Saxony government revoked Transrapid's testing license, citing safety concerns. It was eventually allowed to operate from 2008, and limped on for three more years as public opinion dwindled and government backing wavered. And in 2011, operations at the Emsland test track and the Transrapid project as a whole came to an end. Maybe the Transrapid was a fool's errand. Maybe maglevs wouldn't have survived the intense competition offered by high-speed trains and budget air travel that exploded in the early 2000s. Maybe it wasn't just the accident and the 23 lives cut short that spelled the end for the Transrapid. It's possible that the energy demand from high-speed maglev systems, along with their remarkably high operating costs, meant that they were never really a viable option anyway, even if a wider build-out had gone ahead. Furthermore, Though one might think of maglevs as gliding silently through the air, their sheer speed generates a remarkable amount of noise. At lower speeds, the Transrapid was acclaimed for being significantly quieter than conventional high-speed rail. But once it topped 300 km an hour and started aggressively displacing the air in its path, researchers clocked it emitting around 100 decibels of noise from a distance of 30 meters, similar to the noise levels found in a nightclub or construction site. As a result, maybe public opposition would have doomed it. Who knows? The legacy of the Transrapid high-speed maglev lives on to an extent. Japan is currently experimenting with ultra-high-speed maglevs, and China also has a couple of plans in the pipeline, although they appear to have been stuck in development hell for over a decade. Maybe their eventual surfacing will see a renaissance in public demand for maglevs, particularly as advancing technology allows us to create more efficient, quieter machines. Or maybe they'll fizzle out and fade away like the Transrapid before them. Again, who knows? For now, the remains of the Emsland test track are a tragic monument to a dream that died before it was truly born. Despite the blood, sweat and tears poured into this project by engineers who effectively made it their life's work, in the grand scheme of human transportation and the need for people to get from A to B, the entire Transrapid project was essentially a flash in the pan, nudged out of the race by advances in more conventional transit technology, and consigned to the scrap heap of history in this remote corner of northern Germany. And now, here in the shadow of the derelict test track at the facility in Latin, not much remains, save for a disused maintenance yard, a few decommissioned vehicles, and 23 elm trees. <laughs>